So we're going to record this session, the um, panel presentation called Talking About Race, Privilege, Gender, and Sexual Orientation in the K-8 Classroom. And um, Aisha, I'm going to invite you just to share a little bit about yourself. We've got some students that have other questions. Um, for those of you um, students in our classes, know that the, the link to the agenda, we'll put it in the chat one more time. You can see all the questions that are going to be asked and who's going to be asking those. But Aisha, why don't you start telling us a little bit about yourself and then I'll let you pick the next person. Thank you so much, Rob. It's always good to see you and uh, my co-panelists who I, I feel like I'm becoming fast friends with. Also, Blanca, I think that we went for matching colors today. Love it. <laughs> um, my name's Aisha. I you she, her, and he, ya, yeah, which is Arabic for her pronouns. Um, I'm also comfortable with they, them. Thank you so much again for inviting us here. I do identify, um, I'm Muslim, I did not grow up in a Muslim family. I actually grew up, uh, my parents are Christian. I have two dads. So I grew up in a very LGBTQ plus positive family. Um, and I, work in mental health right now, but I've also worked in healthcare and a lot of different aspects of healthcare, including emergency health. I have a passion for helping other people. I volunteer with the Diversity Center, the local LGBTQ plus center, because I come from a very LGBTQ plus family and I also identify as queer. I'm gonna pass the mic to Blanca. Thank you, Aisha. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Blanca Baltasar Saba. I identify as she, her, ella. And um, I am a first generation college student. I immigrated to this country at the age of three. My first language is Spanish. Um, growing up, I uh, learned um, English in school. One important thing to know about me is that um, in terms of identity, um, when I crossed the border, I crossed with um, someone else's birth certificate. So I actually had a different identity in terms of my name and who, who I was and who my parents were. As my parents were afraid to register me in school with my real birth name. Um, and so that was a bit confusing once I transitioned to um, my true name. And um, I'll share a little bit more about that later. Um, so I was undocumented until I was in high school and uh, there was the amnesty program. And that is how I became a resident and later a US citizen. And so I am currently uh, the associate superintendent of Salinas Union High School District, where I serve over 16,000 families, 83% of them, which are, um, it's a high poverty area. Um, you're all probably familiar with Salinas. And I think I'd also just like to add that I'm the oldest of four children. Um, my dad worked in agriculture till he um, passed away at the age of 41. My mom became a widow at the age of 40. She worked at the canneries in Watsonville and was part of the Watsonville canning strike in the mid 1980s which is a, an important history lesson for uh, our local area. And so um, I was introduced to social justice issues at a very young age, um, marching alongside Jesse Jackson and Cesar Chavez when they came to Watsonville as part of the Watsonville um, cannery strike. And so I'm uh, my passion for um, ensuring that we provide services um, to our most uh, marginalized students is something that's very personal to me. And so what I do um, as a professional in my current job is make sure that I'm always using that lens um, because I wanna make sure that regardless of the zip code that our students live and where they come from, they're afforded the same opportunities and even more so than their peers if um, they don't come from a privileged backgrounds. And so um, with that, I will pass it on to Glenn. Hi there, everyone. I'm Glenn Nishibayashi. And uh, 
wow, Rob, this is a huge group today. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little intimidated by a number of people, but. Uh, yes, I'm, and they will all be teaching soon and people like Blanca will want to hire them all. All right. Yeah, so I'm a 65 year old. Uh, I identify he, him. I'm learning how to do that. Uh, married to a career educator. She was a teacher for 36 years and taught special education kindergarten, second grade, and third grade, and uh, retired in 2017. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology from UC Riverside, which is where uh, Rob and I first met uh, and played on the volleyball team together. Uh, I have a master's degree in business from UCLA. I retired in 2016 after a career uh, in finance, 26 years in the corporate world and finishing the final six years of my career uh, at UCLA in their budget, finance, and strategic planning office. So uh, that's the quick, uh, quick synopsis of uh, who I am, and we'll get into our stories a little bit later. So I'm going to hand it off to Tyler. Hi, everybody. I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible and, and, and follow the lead of my of my colleagues here. I'm the politician of the group, so I can probably talk too much. So, so my name is Tyler Williamson. I am a council member in the city of Monterey. I first got elected in 2018, and um, my term is up this year. So that's going to be an interesting experience. Um, but just to describe a little bit about how how I got into this, um, I and again the short shortest version possible for me here is. Um, I got involved in the Obama campaign in 2008, and not as much as I wanted to because I was working two jobs, going to school full time. Um, and so I knew in 2012, I was going to make myself more committed. So in the spring of 2012, I signed up for a fellowship program with the Obama campaign, and I eventually ended up um, working on the Obama campaign, and I was responsible for the campaign out of the San Francisco headquarters. Um, and so Obama's one of my my life heroes. He's such a um, an inspiration of mine. His the basis of his campaign is based on um, community organizing, uh, and so I took those community organizing skills and brought them back down here to Monterey, where I helped co-find Monterey Peninsula Pride. So I'm I'm currently the co-chair of Monterey Peninsula Pride, um, uh, and. Yeah, there's there's a lot there's a lot there and, and all these different little things in my life. The other big thing, because council is on paper a part time position, um, my full time day job is I, I'm an HR specialist at the Naval Postgraduate School. So that is um, a little bit about me. All righty, and we can move on to the next question. And so the next question is, can you share a little bit more about your identity and story? What has caused you to be who you are today? So like normal, you'll, one of you is going to start and then you can pass it off, OK? Okay, my colleagues are being shy today. <laughs> I'll go first. So, uh, so the question was what a little bit about my identity and and what was the last part? The last question um, was what has caused you to be who you are today? Yeah, so I shared a little bit at the beginning. So I think um, the fact that uh, I immigrated to this country and um, I grew up in poverty, although I'll say that I didn't know that I was growing up in poverty. I, um, there was a lot, of, a lot of hardworking people in my family. Um, there was always many people in our home, um, never had my own room, never had a quiet space to do my homework, but I always had someone that was home, which was my grandmother, um, after school um, to kind of prepare my after school uh, meal and remind me I needed to do my homework. And so I think the experiences that really um, shaped the person that I am today is in fourth grade, I had a first year teacher, Miss Lucy Valdez, who I'll never forget, who was 
the first teacher who ever cared to ask me about me because prior to that I was um, I would typically get in trouble because I would talk a lot in class and I was the chatterbox in class and she actually sat down with me and asked um, you know Blanca why you know why is it that you go and get out of your seat and go talk to you know your friends and you, know, you do your work and so I remember having this conversation with her about like this work was really easy for me and I was done and I was bored and so she um, immediately made some changes in my schedule so like I would go and read to the kindergartners um, in the morning once I was done with my work and then I would um, leave class to do extensions in math um, and so because I really enjoyed math and analysis and so I think um, as a teacher um, we can make such a huge difference in the lives of students um, all it took for her was to have that interest in me as an individual um, and really took the time to get to know me and to get to know my interests and then I would say that later um, when I was in high school, um, well, actually in middle school, um, I, I shared my experience with participating in the Watsonville canning strike. And then times were really difficult. My dad worked an ad, an ag um, picking strawberries and my mom was on strike. And so there was times where ne both of them were not working. And so there was not very much money coming in. And I remember being embarrassed as a sixth grader, seventh grader, having to stand in line to get government food. Like we would have powdered, uh, box powdered milk and like the big block um, cheddar cheese and like all this food that I was not used to eating. Um, and it was, it was very difficult and I didn't understand why I had to go and have a billboard, you know, um, striking with my mom. I was there, I marched, but I didn't really understand why I was doing it until I was in high school that I realized, oh, like there's, you know, they they were not getting paid fair wages. They didn't have health insurance. They didn't, um, they were not given like their vacation time, like all this stuff, right? Just work working conditions and, the role that unions played and why that was important. And so at the same time, you know, I kind of came to the real, realization um, about my undocumented status and what that meant because in fifth grade, I had actually, um, we had to go to a deportation hearing. Again, I didn't really understand what that meant at that time. My dad was going to be deported and we were all going to be deported. So we were at a hearing and um, the judge, um, they, they put me in the little box and asked me questions and the judge was asking me like where are your friends where do you go to school and so basically the judge based on my responses and I was interpreting for my parents so I I was going back and forth the lawyer didn't speak Spanish my parents didn't speak English so I was the interpreter the, the court did not have an interpreter for my parents and because of that the judge um ended up not deporting us. I had a brother at the time who was born here and asked the lawyer to work with my family to try to get us a, a residency. And so fast forward, it wasn't until um, my sophomore year that I uh, gained a legal residence. So I think all those experiences as um, someone who I saw like being afraid of um, seeing the green van that had, you know, the, the immigration logo before it wasn't INS, it was something else. And um, having to run, like if we were going at the store and then we'd have to like run back home and hide and like just that, um, that fear, but not really understanding because I was so young. All of those experiences, lived experiences, um, really help shape who I am today and, and the leader that I am today because I can empathize with so many of our families. And once I became a professional and I went into teaching, um, I got to meet students that didn't grow up like me, that actually grew up um, with wealth and privilege. And I also learned a lot from them and they got to learn from me. 
And so I feel like it really um, put me at a, in a situation where I was also able to be empathetic and not just, uh, you know, to be able to empathize with others who didn't grow up like me and try to understand their perspective and their point of view coming from a place of privilege and why they wouldn't understand how, why I had my opinions, right? And so I think it kind of balanced out uh, my perspective to being open to different perspectives and um, in leading, especially in tumultuous times, like we have been in the last two years, all of that has really helped me uh, be a good listener and being able to always lead with ensuring that whatever decision we make is based on what's going to be best for our students and having that kind of guiding guide that's like my guiding light right like i always anytime there's a difficult decision it's always about what is in the best interest of our students and so i feel that i do that because of my own personal experience um, leading up and I'll stop there because there's so much more, but I'm going to pass it on to Glenn. Thanks, Blanca. I guess uh, a lot of who I am today is thanks to my, my grandparents and my parents and what they went through. Uh, my, my parents, I'm a third generation Japanese American. Uh, my paternal and maternal grandparents uh, emigrated from Japan. They were the Issei. Uh, my parents were born in Los Angeles, so they were the Nisei, as we call them. And so I'm, I'm third generation Sansei. So a lot of uh, what shaped who I became was, it was based on the perseverance of, of what my parents and grandparents went through, especially during World War II. Uh, under Presidential Executive Order 9066, my parents and grandparents were forced to leave the Los Angeles area. Uh, they were sent to prison camps, which at the time they euphemistically called them internment camps or relocation centers, solely because of their ancestry. Uh, my father's family was sent to Jerome, Arkansas, and my mother's family was sent to Hart Mountain, Wyoming. Uh, my parents and their siblings were all American citizens by birth. My father was 19 and my mother was 17 at the time they were uh, forced to leave their homes. Uh, 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry were sent to these internment camps. Over 60% of them were US citizens, but this was part of the World War II uh, Asian fear, uh, fearing that after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, there was fear that people who looked like uh, the enemy or were ancestors of the home country of Japan uh, would be threats. Uh, so. During those times, uh, I think the politicians said, well, we're, we're going to put these people in camps for their own protection. Uh, but that's a bunch of, uh, <laughs> that's, that was a bunch of hooey. Uh, so my grandparents were not citizens. Uh, they were restricted by law from becoming citizens. There were laws that actually kept them from becoming naturalized citizens. Later in life, laws changed and they were allowed to be naturalized. Uh, my mother graduated from high school while at Heart Mountain and she was the valedictorian of her high school class. I had, uh, my cousin was able to find a copy of her valedictorian speech and it was amazingly uh, positive about her attitudes of being sent to these camps. Uh, I, I could not believe when I read it that my mom could have that kind of a positive attitude coming out of being sent to these camps uh, far, far away from their home in environments that they were not used to. Um, so it was just uh, amazing what they endured and what, uh, what they passed along to me, uh, which really was a life of privilege, uh, never wanting for anything. Well, wanting things, but never needing anything. Uh, my dad was very clear on, uh, he used to always say, do you, do you need that or do you want that? Because I'll make sure that whatever you need, you can have. Uh, so uh, I used to be honest and say, well, I don't really need it, but I want it. Uh, my sister, on the other hand, would say, yeah, I need it, and then she would get it. So uh, that's the benefits of being the baby sister. Uh, anyhow, my father served in the US Army during World War II at the same time that his family was interned in the, uh, in the internment camps. 
He was an officer in the military intelligence service. And in the post-war era, he actually served as an interpreter in the war crimes trials uh, in Tokyo, Japan, uh, serving under General MacArthur. Uh, once Rob asked me uh, to share an experience that I had uh, while visiting the internment camp uh, recently, a couple of years ago on a trip across the country, uh, my wife and my younger son had the opportunity to visit the site of Heart Mountain where there's a nice visitor center now. Uh, as I entered the visitor center, the docent asked if anyone in my family had actually been at Heart Mountain. And of course I told her, yes, my mother and her family had all been there. My mother, my uncle, my aunt, uh, my grandparents, uh, they'd, all, they'd all been there. And as I toured the uh, visitor center there, there was a picture about three feet by five feet large picture uh, and kneeling in the front row was a picture of my grandfather uh, who was a member of the Heart Mountain Photography Club. He was an avid photographer, has actually had a few shows uh, of, his, of his photographs. And it was interesting that a woman who was touring in the museum uh, heard me gasp and saying, oh my God, that's my grandfather. Uh, and she was surprised. She actually said, did you actually know your grandfather? I go, oh yeah, he used to come over to my house all the time. Uh, so it's amazing to me that when we think about things that were that have happened in history, uh, that it seems so long ago, but it wasn't really that long ago that these things happened. Uh, so anyhow, uh, while I was there, uh, the docent gave me an aerial map of the location of the area. And now it's become just farmland, uh, but overlaid on the current uh, geography of the land is, a, is where the different barracks were. And the docent actually circled where my mother's family barrack would have been that they shared with many other families. Uh, so I had a very moving experience to actually stand on the site uh, where my mother's family was, where they were housed. And imagine what it would have been like for an 18 year old to be moved away and sent off to <clears throat> a very desolate, cold place. Going from Los Angeles to Wyoming in, in middle of winter is not uh, the best thing to do uh, when it's all you can take with you is what you can carry. So that's, that's really an important part of my family history that I've really become more in touch with uh, as, as an elder adult now. Uh, and so I, that's, but it really is a part of, of who I am today and how I was raised uh, to always uh, kind of don't make waves, uh, be quiet, study hard, uh, but don't, don't, don't bring attention to yourself. So that's uh, really something that uh, that's, part of me that I didn't really realize until recently. So with that, I will pass it on to Tyler. I, um, am, I just get so inspired hearing this story. And, and as has been stated um, from the get-go, you know, we've done this together several times now and the stories never get old. I get emotional every time I hear Glenn's story. I get emotional every time I hear Blanca's story. I just appreciate being in this space and, and Rob, thanks for continuing to invite me to collaborate with these folks. Um, so, so I'll take my um, history back to my parents um, just to give a little bit of perspective. So my father, um, was born and raised in a town called Waynesboro, Mississippi. Um, can't go much deep south. It's kind of south, southeast Mississippi. Um, and his older brother, um, there was 12 kids total. And his, his older, oldest brother um, would talk back to white people um, in, in their town. And, and my dad was born in, in 47. Um, so a little bit of perspective um pre-civil rights um and so his parents thought that he was going to get himself killed and so they had a family friend that lived close by and they asked if and they had relatives that lived up in in albany new york um so they asked if they could get him to move to albany he did um and then he saved up enough money he bought a car 
he drove down to Mississippi and drove everybody back up, the entire family back up to, to Albany. Um, and so my dad was 12 years old when he migrated up to Albany. My mom is from upstate New York uh, in a town called Glens Falls. Um, if you're familiar with Saratoga Springs, kind of, and it's about 45 minutes north of, of Albany. Um, so my parents met, my mom is white looking, even though she is mixed, she has um, some, some black in her. Um, but when my mom's parents met my father, um, they obviously were not okay with that. They're, they're from a very um, conservative backcountry town and um, it was tense at first. And it took actually my parents having us as kids to allow some of those barriers to be broken. Um, so from a very young age, um, you know, I think the race thing has always been, has, has always been an issue. There's always been tension there. Um, and then just kind of making that um, intersection, right? We have something in the queer community that we often talk about intersectionality, which is coming from two or more disadvantaged communities, um, discriminated communities. And so um, growing up, not really thinking much of it until I got um, maybe into like middle school, high school time frame where, you know, I started noticing uh, maybe an attraction towards people of the same sex more so than the opposite sex. And, uh, and so I would, again, not fully understanding that and realizing it, I, I got bullied by classmates, by my own siblings, um, particularly my older brother. I'm, I'm one of four boys um, and I'm the second oldest. So a lot of um, bullying experiences growing up and it was particularly challenging because, um, you know, it's, I think it's something that is probably not tolerated in, in a lot of families, but I think particularly that the black community, it's something that's very much frowned upon and my dad identifies himself as a preacher man, so he thinks he's somebody. <laughs> and um, and so there was a lot of challenges associated with that. And I would even carry it into when I got into college. Um, the first college that I, I went to after I graduated high school was the Naval Academy um, in Annapolis, Maryland. And I only finished my plebe year there, um, which is your freshman year. I got bullied while I was there. and. Um, for a long time, I thought it had to do more with my race than my sexual orientation. Um, but I didn't come out until maybe several years after that. And the interesting thing about that experience is, is that it was during Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So they probably saw mannerisms, um, but they couldn't say anything. And they're probably thinking that maybe I am who I am and I maybe recognize that, but they can't ask and, and I can't say. Um, but when I look back on it, I, I mean, I remember very specific moments where um, they treated me different in a, when it came to gender identity, I guess, if you will, right? So I remember one specific example where one of the upperclassmen said, at the end of the, they call it plebe summer, they have this thing where they get us together, we stand on the bulkhead, like we're standing against the wall at attention, and the upperclassmen are kind of walking down the center of the P-way is what we call it, the hallway. Um, and then they were doing like skits, kind of making fun of, of us as freshmen, um, which is a lot of things wrong with this in the first place, but it was supposed to be kind of light and humorous. Um, and then one of the upper class said, like in, in like a high pitched voice, like I'm Midshipman Williamson, right? And like speaking as if I was, had a feminine voice um, and like, everybody was laughing, like everybody. And um, it hurt. I mean, it hurt. Like, there's no way around that. Um, so when I think about a little bit about how that's kind of made me the person that I am today, I'm super empathetic. <laughs> um, I really, really feel when people um, describe their feelings. And I think it's an important thing that's often overlooked. Like, I think we spend so much time kind of, you know, even in the education world, thinking about STEM, right? Science, technology, the math, right? The very hard stuff, um, which is important. It's 100% important, but so is empathy and um, kindness and reading. And, you know, there's, there's 
there's this side that I don't, I, I feel um, doesn't get as much attention and, and, and I feel like I provide that space a lot in the spaces that I enter. So I think about my experience on the council. Um, you know, I was the first African-American to be elected to the Monterey City Council. I was the first openly queer person to be elected to the Monterey City Council. I was the youngest person to be elected to the council. So lots of firsts there and that, that burden is heavy. Um, but I bring such a different voice to the council. I am on a council with all straight old white men and nothing against straight old white men, right? Like nothing against them. Um, but if you were to sit and listen to the council meetings, you could see where like, I'm like over here, kind of this voice, and then the rest of them are kind of more over here. And it's, I definitely bring a different voice to the, to the council and your experiences and who you are, right? No matter how much you want to think not, think otherwise, um, it really makes up, it makes a difference in how you see and approach the world and what you can bring to the table. Um, so I try to bring that authentic self. I think another big thing that is, that I've learned over through my, my life experiences is um, integrity. Um, and just trying to stay true to who I am and just kind of being my authentic self. And it's something that I struggle with because, you know, in a lot of ways, the world has told me that it's not okay to be like this. Um, but I've had like so many wonderful, lovely, lovely people. Um, I, I think of you, Aisha, like this, your kindness and care, um, right? Like it just, it makes me feel comfortable in entering a space and being um, who I am, which is important, right? When we're talking about youth coming into a classroom and having the capacity and the ability to be able to learn and to hear what you're saying or hear what the other students are saying, that is so critically important. Like it's like, if you can't, if they're, if they're not listening, then everything else is for naught. Um, and so, yeah, just acceptance um, is, is, is a big piece of that. Um, there's so much more to the story, but I'll stop there for now and, and uh, pass it to Aisha. Thank you so much, Tyler. Uh, I don't know how after we've been on this panel so many times, I feel like I still learned something new about you all. And I just adore you all even, even more for that. And I'm really grateful for um, your candor and your, your sharing. And I always feel like you're super underqualified to be on this panel. <laughs> um, I it grew up sort of in between two worlds because my dad came out when I was pretty young. Um, and my mother lives in Idaho and is sort of a conservative family up there. Just just silencing my kitchen Alexa, everything's fine. Um, so <laughs> um, it, I grew up, you know, in these two worlds. It was very interesting because um, my dad, he, after he came out, he moved to California and he met my other dad. They've been together for quite a while. I won't say how long because it'll almost age me and I'm very age non-specific. Um, but they've been together for a really long time, more than two decades. Um, and when I was young, I sort of used to feel like I led two simultaneously very interestingly different lives. Um, I would go to school and, and I went to, uh, I lived in a sort of conservative town. I was uh, definitely a little bit of a pariah after everybody knew that my dad was gay. Um, I lost a lot of friends in that time and found out a lot of, of what people were saying behind my back. You know, um, it was interesting. I became best friends with my best friend at the time because I watched her stand up for someone else in the bus when, when jocks were bullying somebody for, for being gay. And I, she was just so proud and she was just so stand up ish. And she challenged them to say those kinds of things to her face. And everyone was scared of Brenda. So I was like, oh, she has to be my friend. Um, and I really learned at the time that I, I was probably a pretty angry teenager, but I think it was because there was just so much around me that I didn't agree with. And thankfully my other sort of upbringing was in the LGBTQ plus community. My dad's for a while lived above a gay bar and I would go on my breaks and winter and summer and hang out with drag queens as they got, got dressed to perform. And they taught me so much about loving yourself, about being your authentic self, about not listening to people who, who hate on you for who you are. And it really just meant so much to me. I think later um, 
when I converted to Islam, I've been Muslim for about 20 years. Actually, I think this is gonna be my 22nd Ramadan starting in April. Um, I, I The reason I think that I was able to wear a scarf in so many different situations was just because I had grown up in this community that said like, you're great and wonderful for who you are. And if other people don't know that, then that's their loss. And um, I have just hopefully sort of carried that with me and hopefully always carried with me the idea that you have to stand up for, for other people and really listen to them when they tell you their experience and do your best to advocate for people in a way that really leverages the privilege that you have in life. I was really lucky that I had friends who um, educated me on real history, as I call it, because I was just taught such whitewashed history. And to be honest, many years later, I'm still very salty about it. But thankfully, you know, people gave me um, the the people's history of the United States, and that changed my life. And people gave me so many different um, historical backgrounds and experiences that that they had had, and I was willing to listen. And um, I just hope that as we move forward, you all are teaching a really well-rounded version of history and not just this glossed over version of it. Um, I'm really grateful to the people who took time out to explain to me my own ignorance at one point, probably in a much nicer way. Um, and that's really something that I try to carry with me every day. Um, when I, like now in my life, I really hard, try very hard to be an LGBTQ plus activist and I do interfaith work in the Muslim community. And I was really nervous about that for a while when um, I had just become a leader in the Muslim community in college. But, you know, everywhere that I go so far, I get a pretty, decent reaction. And then I, I do still always believe that if people don't like it, it's too bad. Um, so I, I try to live that every day and really stand up for, for folks and um, help people. I think the hardest thing for me growing up was not seeing myself and like my, everyone would always say like your parents, your mom and dad, or, um, you know, they really have a very binary heteronormative idea of what kids are going through at home and nowadays I hear a lot of my parents my friends who are parents in California their peer their kids get to hear your parents your guardians and I think all of those things make a huge difference in, in making kids feel valid and accepted and also just not putting up with um that bullying that that kids can tend towards, that humans can tend towards um, in class, it would have made a lot of a difference to me if anyone I think had stood up for me when I was young until I met Brenda, who's the mouthiest person in the world and my best friend to this day. Um, it makes a huge difference when someone stands up for you, particularly if it's somebody you don't know or someone in a, in a place of authority. I think I would have had a, a lot less trouble and been maybe a little bit less angry as a teenager if someone had done that. And with that, I'll close. Thank you so much for sharing. As we move on to the next question, it is, how did you see yourself or not in the curriculum, particularly in your history classes in elementary, middle, or high school? Do you remember your teachers talking about your culture or history in the classroom at any time? We're going to start with Glenn because um, as... Um, I got to go to Heart Mountain, and um, so I want, I wanted to show you the photo that, oh, you're not, are you seeing the photo? Yeah, yes, I can see it. On Flickr. Oh, great, yeah. So Glenn, I, I thought you'd go first on this question, and if there was anything else you wanted to add. Yeah, so my, uh, my grandfather is the one in the middle kneeling behind the little boy that uh, someone is nice enough to put the cursor on. Uh, I remember going there with my, uh, with my younger son and uh, pointing out that picture and saying, son, this is why you have big ears. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of the question, uh, I would say that uh, the World War II internment experience was never in any curriculum when I was in high school. I understand that it, it might be now, uh, but when I was there, uh, in high school, which was a million years ago. Uh, it was never a part of the discussion of World War II. Uh, so my family history was not in the books. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's an important thing to note uh, is that um, if, 
I know that classroom time is very, very, very uh, tight. Uh, having had a wife who was a teacher, I know that there's all these things you have to get through. Uh, so there's a limited amount of time. So you have to be very careful about how you use your time. But when your personal history is not included, uh, then to me that shows that uh, it's not important. And if your history isn't important, then it discounts uh, your personal value. Uh, so my family's experience in the internment camps was never represented in the classroom. Um, and so that was just the only way I learned that in history was just through family stories. So I think it's important as we, as you launch your careers into teaching history, I think it would be great for, uh, for your students to actually uh, share their family history uh, so that your, your students in your classroom can get a different perspective on history because each of us comes from a different place. And I think that would be a great way uh, to broaden the, his, the experience of history as well as gives your students a chance to uh, do public speaking, which I think is, uh, I've known that public speaking is a difficult thing for most adults. It's one of the things that people fear most is public speaking. And so getting your students to talk about their family history would be a great way to uh, kill two birds with one stone there. So I'll pass it on to who, who wants to go next? Okay, I'll, I'll pass it off to Blanca. Thank you, Glenn. And I think I um, I had a similar experience. I do not remember um, my history being shared and um, growing up in elementary, middle school, high school, I didn't really learn much about my history until I was in college. And so, um, uh, Glenn, I'll let you know, I don't think I've shared this before, but um, in at Watsonville High School where I graduated from, we had a teacher, um, Moss Hashimoto, who taught US history and he lived in um, internment camp. So the students in Watsonville definitely got to hear about the Japanese experience from him. He's like a living legend here in this community. Um, and, I, and I also agree with Glenn that um, having students share their own stories and interviewing uh, their grandparents, their great grandparents, their parents, to learn more about their history is so important. Um, I was able to do that when I was in college and I learned so much just about the Bracero program um, that my grandfather was part of and all the different states he worked in and um, how, how life was like for him. And, you know, he actually got residency through his employer here in Watsonville where he ended up settling because the community and the climate was very similar to where we're from in Mexico, which is the state of Michoacan in a small um, town called Quiroga. And so I think had I had that opportunity in elementary school, I would have been more curious and asked more questions um, or about my grandmother's side of the family on my mom's side and kind of the Spanish bloodline there and um, her she remembered she was born in 1918 and just about the Mexican Revolution and just so much rich history that um, that I learned, but it was it was late. And so when we're learning history, we feel so disconnected from it. And then sometimes the history always makes anybody who's not European look bad. <laughs> and so um, it's it's so important. Um, so I would echo Glenn's sentiment of as you enter your teaching career to remember that and give students that voice. And I'll um, pass it on to Aisha. Thank you. Um, I, th I think that when I look at, I love the idea that you all talk about, about interviewing your family members. I actually didn't even realize that one of my grandfathers um, had moved to America um, because my my Latin Hex family are very sort of um, they they're very whitewashed. They really didn't raise us at all with a language with too much culture that was related to them. Um, and it wasn't until my grandfather died that I found out so much about him. It's really a, a blessing to be able to interview our family members and learn about them and their history while they're alive. 
That's why I love a lot of those historical projects that just go out and interview people from different cultures and get more information about them because it's so important. Um, and if we don't do that, we lose that. And it's important when I look at the world today and, and everyone who's sort of scared of um, telling history in a way that makes people feel bad, I just want to say that the, the sort of the first reaction I think of, um, you know, cause my family's also white, the, the first reaction that people often have is sort of feeling bad or being angry. But after that, people move on to being a lot more empathetic and they move on to wanting to know more and they move on to, to wanting to be informed about history. And if we don't learn our history, then we will lose it and we'll lose that really important context. Um, I think when it came to, I didn't realize there were so many heroes in LGBTQ plus history until I was much older and in college. Um, later as a Muslim, when I went to college, I found out all sorts of great Muslim heroes as well. And that was really sort of shocking because I hadn't been introduced to, to a lot of characters from around the world. In fact, US history is so insular that we learn one version of like just American history when the world is a big, huge place. And um, if you live around the world, that's probably one of the biggest things that people say about American education, that we don't get enough of this well-rounded sort of world perspective. Um, and it, I think, has a real impact on how we view the world. I hear a lot of my peers right now talking about um, how sometimes we see refugees from one place and it gets a ton of sympathy. Like Ukraine has been on my mind all the time. I wake up in the morning and I check my favorite cat lady's Twitter. Why? Because I wanna make sure she's okay because I'm like invested in Senta and I hope to God that she and her family are still okay out there in the world. Um, and people point out that that's not the reaction we have when war happens maybe in other places in the global South. And, um, you know, how many newscasters recently have said like, oh, this is different because it's from a civilized country, like Baghdad and Syria, those places were civilized. They were like the heart of civilization. Where did the first written laws come out of? Baghdad. Um, so there's so much more than just American history and I think it affects everybody. And uh, we're doing, a, a, a disservice to ourselves by not teaching that. And I think, um, that's the still thing that still keeps me hopefully like with this righteous indignation at history and the world, like seeing, I do not want to see my fictional future children learn about the missions and make a tiny little mission. I don't, I don't want to see that anymore. Like we know what missions are about. Um, it's, we need to tell that history. We need to tell that like the stories of the indigenous people who lived here, who almost lost their language, you know, who were almost absolutely annihilated by people who like took the land. But it's so important not to just tell that one viewpoint of history because the world is so much bigger. And I'm grateful every time to, to sit here with you all that tell me more about that. And hopefully, um, hopefully I learned enough to be, to be humble and listen to that when people tell me that they have a different experience as a person of color or as a trans person or any of those things. Like, I want to listen and, and understand. And if we get that experience in our history classes, that really helps us as we move forward to see that the world isn't just this one tiny viewpoint. Um, and I will pass it to Tyler. Yeah, so um, I think you all said it, said it all already in regards to like the lack of representation in in learning history in grade school, and I would say that's definitely the case um, fr from my experience as a as a black person, um, as a queer person, and in particular when we talk about the intersectionality, right? So I think about um, writers like James Baldwin. Um, I think about um, local activists doing the real work in the community that could be leveraged. Like um, I, I, I call him Quasar, but he um, works at CSUMB, um, Stephen Goings. Um, some of you may have heard just doing great work in the community as a, uh, as a queer person. Um, 
I think of um, Mel Mason, who's well known um, for doing work in the African American community locally. Right, there's a lot of resources that can be tapped into. Um, that it was just a, I think, a lost opportunity. I mean, I remember, I, I don't know, I can't remember what grade it was, um, but I remember going into a history book and it was like a section of a chapter in the history book and it talked about um, the Stonewall riots. I mean, it must have been like civil rights movement or something, right? And it was just like a, a little paragraph, Stonewall riots, a picture, and then it kind of moved on to the next thing. And it's like, that doesn't do it justice. Um, and I just kind of want to make that connection to what all of you said in regards to the, the, the power of, of, of a story. It's so important for folks to be able to, to be able to share stories. And I would say not even just from one's family, which I think that it tends to connect there in regards to perhaps one's race or ethnicity or country of origin. Um, but when you're queer, um, it may not be, it may be a little bit harder to get that from your family, unless there's a queer person in your family that you've been able to um, connect with, or you just have super supportive parents, which exist and they're out there. Um, and so it, it makes me reflect on too, my experience with the Obama campaign, right? When I was telling you about the community organizing, um, the, the fundamental piece of the community organizing and there was like the snowflake effect, if anybody understands what I'm saying there, it's like one person kind of finds three people and it kind of spreads type of thing. But the whole basis of that and like you going out there and saying something, it's your story. And it's like taking an issue like healthcare and talking about how you had this experience and because nobody can argue with your story, it's your story um, and it's very powerful. And so I think for little ones to be able to um, share their story and learn from one another, as opposed to something that's done through a lecture, um, which is kind of like a one-way conversation usually. Um, it, it can go a long way um, towards the learning experience and the learning process. And I'm just gonna throw one last piece in here and say that I imagine that some of you may become administrators um, at some point. And so, it's important through all levels of the educational experience. Um, and so as an administrator, right, it's important to recruit folks that look different than what is typically seen, right? So it's important to have queer people in positions of leadership because you might be able to pull them into a classroom and help speak to students when the subject comes up or just them seeing them around campus and being open about that experience it can make, it can save somebody's life. So um, uh, representation matters and, and it could be in the smallest of ways. Uh, Rob, if I may just add, I, I, in the chat, I'm going to upload, I'm gonna share um, a link to a slide deck, um, which is a, a poem that my son wrote in fourth grade instead of building a mission. Um, he was at a dual immersion school and his teacher gave them choices. And so it is in Spanish, but it's a two voice poem. So it's the perspective of the conquistadores and the perspectives of the indígenas. And I wanna share it with you as a, as a model of showing, um, giving students choice can just bring up so much. And I remember he was so passionate about it and so angry at learning the other side of the history. And so um, to this date, his teacher uses it as a model. He is now a sophomore in high school, <laughs> but this is in fourth grade. So I, I'll, I'll just put the link there. You can take a look at it later. If, if I could just throw one, one last thing out that I, I forgot to bring up is, I think like setting some ground rules, right? So that way, when a conversation starts, you kind of set the expectation of what is not appropriate and, and what is, um, and I think that's really important, especially when you're getting into a very touchy subject, um, because uh, you know if somebody says something that is inappropriate and it's not addressed from the get-go, their response, even though it was wrong, their response might be valid because they were going into a conversation where they didn't fully understand that. So I think having those those foundational rules when you're beginning beginning a conversation are 
are essential to make people feel more open and, and talking um, and sharing their own experiences. So Pat, um, going to that question, what you were just talking about, Tyler. Um, so some families may feel um, uncomfortable discussing these topics. What is the best way to educate parents about teaching topics of race, privilege, gender, and sexual orientation? And also how should uh, teachers handle personal conflicts that they uh, may come in uh, contact with while uh, teaching these in the classroom, um, especially around social justice? Tally, you wanna jump on that? Was it, did you say Tyler? Yes. <laughs> could you say the question one more time? Yeah, so it's like a two part question. So um, you were talking about like the conflicts, um, you know, pertaining to certain um, topics. So I guess uh, the question, my question is, um, so some families may be uncomfortable discussing these or having like kids be taught about, you know, race uh, and uh, sexuality and privilege. How can we educate parents on these? Um, and also how can we educate our, our instructors to be able to properly teach these topics in the classroom, um, especially topics surrounding social justice? Yeah, so I think it does, you're right, it does get into what I was just saying in regards to like setting those ground foundational rules. My, my partner is a, um, a history teacher in Al Sol. He's actually taking classes right now for his education administration degree. So sometimes it's nice because I get to listen in to like what he's learning, it's fascinating. Um, and so they were talking about this, this very subject, like how do you deal with the conflict of parents that might, you know, try to use religious, um, uh, their, their religion as, a, as an excuse to, for their children not to have to learn some of these things. And um, what you are allowed to teach in the classroom is history, right? And you can't, you cannot take, um, and I apologize if I'm not fully framing this in the right way because I'm not a teacher, um, but just from what I'm hearing, right? It's um, like the, the, the parent can feel uncomfortable about that, um, but the content is the content and that's part, of, that's a requirement, that's part of the um, curriculum. And so they're allowed to teach those and they have to teach those um, in a public school. So, um, you know, I think how do you address that appropriately with parents? Um, you know, it, it's, it's a tough thing because the, the focus needs to be on the children, right, on the youth. And I think if the parents um, really care about that, they're going to make sure that their children have the best education possible. So I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to be able to speak to how to address the parents um, specifically, because I don't know how that, those, those rules work with, um, with the education system. Um, but parents are such an essential part of that conversation, right? Because the children are going home every day, they're spending most of their time with those parents. And so as much as possible, if we can find ways of getting parents on board and getting them actively engaged in what's going on with the curriculum, keeping them posted and aware, like that communication I think is, is just really important. So I'm interested in hearing particularly what Blanca has to say in regards to this question. So I'm gonna pass it to Blanca. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. So a couple things in terms of, um, especially I think it's a little bit um, in elementary school might be a little bit easier to do it through books um, when you're um, touching on these subjects and having um, parent nights uh, where you're going to have these conversations and there's an outline and you are you may get those parents who um, and actually staff so um, that may not feel comfortable teaching the content and so I go back to what Tyler said, which is we're teaching history. These are facts. So we're not we're not trying to um, change anybody's belief system of who, what their identity is, or um, you know, they're they're changing their gender or any of that. It, this is about this is the history. This is factual. And just like we teach about slavery right that's a fact in history we teach it from a certain perspective then we need to also teach it from from this uh other point of view and i will say that um i don't know rob maybe four years ago when we started incorporating 
LGBTQ history into our curriculum in, in the high school district, so middle school and high school. Um, I'll say that I think there was a much more fear from the staff than actually what ended up happening once we once we integrated it and once we shared. We had very few um, parents, but I think a lot of it had to do with the professional development that we prepared teachers with and Rob was uh, led that professional development for us and also having the teachers understand that this is history and how to introduce the history um, so that it didn't feel um, overwhelming right for for the students and also to be prepared for um, students emotions right because for the first time ever in a student's experience you know, if they're gay or lesbian or queer, they're for the first time ever, they're going to be listening to part of their story. And so we also had to acknowledge that this might bring up some emotions and, you know, things that students are going to have to deal with. So we also were prepared with ensuring that we had the counseling available for students and sharing with students that, you know, after class, if this provoked emotions and they needed to talk to someone, this is, these are the resources that are available. Or they could just check in with the teacher, touch base with the teacher. So I think anytime we are gonna to touch a delicate subject as educators, we just need to be prepared for that and have kind of that backup plan to support the student and the family. Um, and the best way I think to, to build that rapport with families and that trust prior to you getting into those topics is by through those um, communications with the family and trying to contact them um, and, and reaching out to them and just getting to know them because a lot of it is the fear of who is this teacher, who is this educator, right? And so I think by building that rapport with them, especially I think it's a lot easier in elementary than secondary just because you have one set of students or maybe two right, as opposed to high school. Um, but I think the professional development for the staff is key before embarking on this because you all need the tools and the language to be able to teach the content and then to be able to respond um, to students and to parents. So I think the professional development is really important. And I'll pass it on to Glenn. I guess, I guess in the news, I hear about people afraid that their kids are going to feel bad when they hear their history or their role in history, and uh, you know what, in in particular, what the government did to my family, uh, and that that was based that was based completely on racism. Uh, I, I have trouble feeling sympathy for someone who might have their feelings hurt because. <laughs> They feel guilty for what happened. I think we all need to face those things that that we have done in the past. Uh, and I know that this is tough because you've got parents, you've got parent pressure, uh, but I think you need administrators like Blanca there to have your back. Uh, so we just need more administrators like Blanca because I know Blanca is an advocate for the teachers to be able to do what they do and to do it in, in a, in a in a way that gives you different perspectives because history, uh, what gets written in the books and what gets in the curriculum is driven by those who are in power, right? And oftentimes I think we need to figure out how do we get those people in power to recognize different perspectives on history? Because in my, in my years, I've, I'm starting to be much more open to listening to different perspectives on history. Uh, uh, my trip to Washington, D.C. and going to the American Indian Museum opened my eyes to a lot of the history of what happened to the Native Americans in the United States, and it was all driven by the government. And so I think it's uh, kids, kids want to learn. Kids need to learn in diverse ways, and they need to learn diversity. Uh, and I think you as educators you're the front line of teaching that and you need to push your administrators and your administrators need to be educated so that they can support you in that in teaching that history and i think we need to work on making sure that the curriculum is much more balanced in how we how we present american history so it just doesn't 
show that you know we've always done things the right way because we haven't always done things the right way. We've done many, we, we learn from our mistakes. And I think if we don't teach where our mistakes were, then we're, as, as the saying goes, we're destined to repeat it. So I think we really need to focus on how do we show a, a broad perspective of history and different versions of history of the same event uh, from a different perspective. So I encourage all of you as new educators to go out there and do that. I know it's hard, uh, but the hard things are often the most important things that we do are the hard things. Do we pass it off to, did Tyler get to, Tyler weighed in on this one already? Oh, Aisha's, Aisha, I'm, I'm sure you have something to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. I always, de I definitely, I think we all um, really tend to defer to the experienced educator in the room, Blanca. I, I don't even know what to say to follow up everyone's amazing um, comments, except for that. Uh, I think I love that what you're allowed to teach is history in the classroom, because that's truly a thing where just by including other people's history, you give them a voice and you speak to something that um, really matters to other people in the room. And even in our subcultures, right, we have different levels of discrimination or leaving out people's story. And it really took a while for the LGBTQ plus community to come out and talk about how the people who started Stonewall were trans women of color. Like it took us forever to really talk about the original queens of, of Stonewall, the, the mothers of like the LGBTQ plus revolution, um, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. Like I wanna grow up in a world where people know about Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. I wanna grow up in a world where people are educated about Muslim explorers who just explored the world and conquered nothing, just said hi and did some trading. Like, um, I do hope that among all of the things you teach in history that you you touch on the similarities uh, among all different faiths. I definitely was not taught that when I was young and ironically became Muslim when I, as a very opinionated young person, debated some Muslims. And I don't know if I won or lost that, but I guess um, I ended up in a place that I'm very happy with myself. And um, if, if we would just teach that aspect of history, I think that could save a lot of time and trouble. I don't know. I love to be on panels, interfaith panels, LGBTQ plus panels, but I am often stuck talking about how, you know, surprise, Muslims love Jesus, or like, I choose what I wear. Uh, and those kinds of things can be easily, at least some of those misconceptions can be easily people can be sort of stripped of their misconceptions if they see heroes in the world who already have those things, who, you know, that's why I love to see comic books that feature Miss Marvel. She's a Muslim Pakistani superhero. You know, the more we see a diverse group of people, the less likely we are to just generalize based on one tiny little story that we hear over and over and over. Um, and I guess, lastly, I, I hope that whenever it comes to if if your your school honors holidays, and you ever um, even if you don't have a single Muslim in the class, I hope you let people know about Eid and Ramadan. I hope you let people know about really awesome um, holidays like Diwali in the Hindu faith. I hope that you just take every chance to expand their horizon and know more about the world because it makes it so much more of an interesting place than just learning from this tiny viewpoint and I think I'm really proud of people like like Rob who worked on the LGBTQ plus um, curriculum in the state and Blanca thank you so much for supporting your your teachers as, as they teach that it makes a huge difference particularly to LGBTQ plus kids to see themselves like reflected in that thanks sorry I don't know how to deal with difficult parents I think that's why I'm not a teacher but I love teachers and you're the future all right, so the next question is, what would you like to have seen in the curriculum when you were a student? And what recommendations do you have about how race, privilege, gender, and sexual orientation should be included in the curriculum? I think I kind of alluded to it. Um, 
so definitely more local history um, reflective of the people in the community. So for example, in my case, um, uh, just about the Bracero program, right? Like there were so many people um, in California that uh, a lot of Mexican workers who came and helped um, with the development uh, and help with the economics to lift this country, right? And so learning about that, um, now with the Watsonville canning strike in the mid 80s, you know, this was led by many uh, women of color, Filipino, uh, Mexican women um, who were, you know, fighting for their rights. And it's very appropriate. It's Women's History Month, right? So this would be a great story to to, to tell this this month. Um, and so I would have liked to have seen more things like reflected a history reflected of the community that is in the classrooms. And the second part to the question was, it was what recommendations do you have about how race, privilege, gender, and sexual orientation should be included in the curriculum? So I will share, um, I think as I walked in, uh, Rob was sharing like the social justice standards, right? That can be integrated into the curriculum. So I think that's definitely one way. Um, the other way is uh, as you're integrating and looking at topics, um, all these topics can be integrated, but what you need to do is make sure you give teachers time to look at the different standards so that they, they are integrated. So for example, in our district, um, every summer we, have, we give teachers an opportunity to come together for one week and we call it our CIA week. Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Week, where they take a look at their scope and sequence and we pay them to come in and look at what worked and what didn't work. And then this year, for example, we're trying to figure out how do we integrate SEL into the curriculum in, in middle school and high school is a little bit more challenging than perhaps at the elementary school. So how do we integrate SEL and mathematics? And we just, um, we're getting ready to launch that series of PD but you need time. So I think by uh, the schools or the district having the commitment to give teachers time to be able to do that work because it's time consuming and you need to be really thoughtful. Um, so whether it's hiring a consultant to come in to help the teachers do that if there, if there aren't like um, teachers on special assignment that can lead that work hiring a consultant that can come and do that because there are standards out there like the social justice standards and there's uh, the frameworks uh, that include so many different histories, but I think it's the time that people need to be able to put this together. So that would be my recommendation. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so lots of things um, weren't taught. Um, you know, I, I think of the classic example that perhaps comes to a lot of our minds, which is um, when Europeans came to the Americas and the effect that it had on Native Americans. I mean, we we did like a play where it's like, Thanksgiving and let's all sit down together, right? It's crazy. And and this is still going on today. Like this is still happening. And, and so um, I think for us to think about like, how do we connect this to today and how it affects groups of people today, right? So like creating a space to like reflect on this history and see its impact um, and, and how, um, it has changed the way it, that groups of people live and exist in, in today's society. So um, I think it's important to say that, you know, upwards of 90% of Native Americans were wiped out by measles, smallpox, the flu, um, things that they weren't exposed to, never mind um, how many were killed um, through battles and, and, and fights and, and land grabs of, of native land. So I think that's a good example. I think of, you know, African American history. Um, I just a couple months ago, I, I read um, the 1619 project, um, which is a great book. I, I, I encourage all to 
to read that. Um, but again, I think it would be interesting to have a conversation of beyond just saying slave, uh, you know, Africans were brought on slave ships to the United States and they were, you know, they were slaves and it was wrong. And, you know, kind of just generally that message. It would be interesting to have a conversation around like the 13th Amendment and like seeing how slavery transitioned into this other thing and how that has an impact on today's society. Um, so I think, you know, these are just, I think, some examples. I, I think the point that I'm making is like somehow giving it the context of how is it relevant for today and like maybe describing how we're still struggling with um, handling some of these conflicts um, in today's society. And then the second part, um, not race privilege. Yeah, I think that kind of covers, I think that kind of covers it. I'll stop there and I'll pass it to Glenn. As I, as I think about how history is taught in our schools, uh, we're, we teach history be, the way we were taught history. And I think the, the key is to really, uh, and so as a result, I think we have a lot of blind spots. Each of us has our own blind spots. Uh, my son is one who has helped me to uh, look into my blind spots. He's uh, through this pandemic is one of the blessings has been, he's given me a reading list. Whenever I finish a book, he gives me another book to read about, uh, about different social justice issues. He's, uh, he's my social justice guider uh, getting through this. So I think as educators, uh, each of, each of you has blind spots that, that I think we need to explore. And I think that requires some curiosity on your part to learn, learn history from different perspectives. Um, some of you may have never heard the story of, of internment camps that you heard from me today. Uh, but if you, there's plenty of books out there about it. And I think uh, we need to encourage our educators to expand their knowledge and, and look at their blind spots to figure out how do we teach history from a different a different perspective or from more perspectives than just the one we've traditionally learned from. And I'll pass that on to Aisha. I think she's, she gets another shot at this one. Um, this is, is true. It's a subject I care so much about how we, we present things in history because I would, would like to see no more whitewashed history. Um, not just being told from that perspective and definitely not all of sort of the mistellings that I, I grew up hearing. Um, I would love to see people talk about diverse leaders, like uh, in the Muslim world, how did I take my entire life without not learning about an amazing traveler called Ibn al-Arabi who wrote all of these books, traveled the world. You know, there are amazing explorers from um, China who went all the way around the world and went to the West Coast long before white people even settled on the East Coast. Um, a very famous traveler called Zhang Xi, and he uh, was a Muslim also. You know, there's so many people in history that if you just highlight them in, in your class, you'll be bringing so much more knowledge to folks and really helping to round out their education. Um, even with young kids, but I think when it comes to, to older kids that showing these diverse leaders really, really matters because it's also how young people see themselves, like the chances that they see that they can be a leader or that they can join their, their other colleagues and, and also see themselves as um, someone who could be anything that they want, a doctor, a lawyer, economist. Um, and finally, I guess I would suggest that when Glenn talked about looking at our own biases, one thing that I realize a lot is um, sort of that how much language really matters when we refer to people, places or things like um, toning down or use of words like, like crazy um, or lame, right? Which it turns out is ableist or, or really being thoughtful about our words can make a huge difference to young people, not, not um, glossing over things and just remembering that in your own way, just because you're there standing in front of them, you are 
like a leader to them. So even if they don't necessarily agree with you, your opinion does matter and you've given them something else to think about throughout their lives. The teachers that mattered to me most in my life um, were probably ones who were my teachers in a time when I was going through a lot of depression or when I didn't have friends and they took the time out to, to care about me and what I was going through on the side of teaching a history class or, um, you know, when I found out my peers didn't like me anymore because my dad was gay and they were like, that's okay. You're still, you're still the same person. Everything that you do in, in class really matters and, and will carry with these young people for, for a long time. Thank you so much for being in a class like Rob's where we talk about these things and we really um, get there and, and discuss difficult subjects. Also, uh, speaking of difficult subjects, why did no one teach me about re reconstruction? you know, the part after the Civil War where suddenly African-Americans from the South are being hugely elected to Congress and then everybody who's a racist gets really salty about it, takes them all out of power, and then basically is, that's the rise of the Klan, that's the rise of controlling people through race. I Because it was an uncomfortable subject, I think, where I grew up with, no one taught me that. I'm sure there's ways to teach that that aren't harmful and aren't hurtful, but um, perhaps when you're going through that section of history, you just tell the story of some famous you know, politician at that time who, who wasn't a politician for long enough, or um, just recognizing that as white folks, we have a whole lot of privilege. And that includes when we say things like women make 81 cents on the dollar compared to white men, when that's not true, that's white women. Like, uh, women who are and people of color are making a lot less than that like for latinas it's still a less than 60 cents on the dollar for white men so just kind of keeping those kinds of things in in context and really making sure that we're doing our best to represent a whole swath of people and not buttonholing people like do you, apparently it is really hurtful to a lot of people i've known in my life when they meet a tall African-American person and they tell them they look like a basketball player, like just tell everyone they look like an economist or a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher. And I think you will have come a, a long way in helping support people to just be like their true selves and see themselves as someone who can succeed. Thanks for listening to my opinions. I just wanted to throw one quick thing out that Glenn, uh, Glenn made me think about. I think it's also important to admit that you've learned something from your students, right? Like that opportunity for them to see that you're still learning and growing too kind of gets them in the mindset that they could be lifelong learners. Okay, next question. Um, this is from the, the check-in document I did for my section. There are some amazing questions in here and a lot of the questions you've touched on. So thank you all for being so thorough um, with what you've been sharing. There's one in here that just really stood out and I'm gonna read the entire thing. Um, it says, one question that I have about teaching about race, privilege, gender and sexual orientation in the history classroom is how can I create a safe space for all of my students in order to make them feel like they can express their thoughts, questions and opinions? I think it's super important to um, build relationships with the students before you dive into those conversations. And so um, since day one in your classroom, whether it's um, giving them index cards, asking them five questions about themselves so that you get to know them. Um, I, when I was a teacher, I would like to um, just kind of go in and check in. And if they said, oh, like I just had a baby sister or like I'm the oldest or whatever, like whatever connection I could make, whether it was they were into comics, whether whatever they were playing, they were an athlete. I always made it a point to try to make that connection. And then if you have them in groups and you build, you have those um, connecting activities with the student. And it's it's so important that as a teacher or the educator, you are vulnerable yourself. So I never asked a question of my students that I wasn't willing to answer myself so that they got to know me and they saw me and my vulnerability so that then they would feel comfortable. And once you build that relationship, it's you'd be surprised at how open they will be. But you can't have those conversations and you can't. Um, the other thing that I've also switched from is like, 
moving away from the safe space to the brave space because I don't know that we're ever gonna enter a safe space entirely, but we can be in a brave space where we have the courage to speak our truth and that we know that it's scary, but we also acknowledge that we're not everybody may agree, right? Because I think it's, it's almost not true that we could enter 100% safe space, right? But we can enter that brave space and so, um, I think kind of switching that language too about creating a brave space in our classrooms and what, what that looks like um, is important. Relationships always first. I, I, I um, there's, there's this piece, right? And this is my, my, my empathetic side, right? But there's this piece where it's like, I, I think about a, a, an experience that I had in the classroom where I was bullied on a classmate and it was something like, oh, you're, he's like a girl or something, right? And this is like in front of the whole class, right? And the teacher is like, Tommy, don't do that. That's inappropriate, stop it. Kind of like, and that was it, right? And we, and we moved on. And so part of this is like, well, people need to develop thick skin and like be able to deal with these kind of circumstances and situations, which, to a certain extent, it's true, right? Like you need to be able to live and exist and figure out how to handle these situations when you're not in front of a teacher or, or a principal or something, right? So yes, that's true, but also the teacher not really doing anything about it also kind of makes it seem like it's okay. So I think setting those ground rule, foundate, foundational rules is very, very important. I think as, as teachers, it's really difficult to do, but to create that safe space in your classroom where you are advocates for all your students. It, it's, it's really important because all it takes is for a teacher to just make one, make you feel bad once, and that student will feel unsafe in that environment and will probably not participate and probably not reach their full potential because, because they feel that they have been uh, not respected, not valued as much as other people. I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a tough, tough job. Being an educator is such a tough job. I watched my wife do it for 36 years. It's very tough, but it's, it's, it's the most important job that I can think of for our future. And creating that safe space where everyone feels welcomed and everyone feels supported and uh, having your eyes and ears and your heart open all the time to the sensitivity that someone's little comment may not mean much to you, but it could mean something a lot to some other student. So I think always having your, your radar up and aware of what's the dynamic of what's going on in your classroom. Uh, you know, who are the bullies in the classroom? Who are the kids who are really confident? Who are the kids who are shy? Because um, the shy kids, shy kids have a right to, to have their opinions too and to be respected. So I think as, as educators, creating that environment is, it's a hard thing to do, um, but that's, that's a really important role that you have is to be the advocate for every student in your classroom. Rob, did you want to ask a question from your um, check-in document? I have another one, but I want to make sure that we're... Um, oh, no, go ahead. You can ask your question and finish things out. That'd be great, Rebecca. Okay. Well, the other one um, I do have, and in, in my section, um, probably two-thirds of teacher candidates who are in kinder, first and second grade, so a lot of young, young students. Um, so many asked, um, how can we really introduce these topics to our younger students? I know we've touched on this before, but if we could reiterate how can we reach our younger students? Um, that would be that would be great. So I am a big fan of conversations around pronouns. Um, it's a it's a very easy um, concept to understand from a very young age, and so I think just getting folks to getting the little ones to understand, like how do you identify and. Um, and I can guarantee you that there are kids that age that will identify using different gender pronouns um, than people would assume. So I think 
creating that space to, to use gender pronouns. Um, and then I also think it's a space, particularly for, if we're talking specifically about LGBTQ related issues, it's helpful to get them to learn about like what those different letters mean. And, and there's more than just LGBTQ, right? That's why there's the plus at the end. So I think having some experiences where they can learn about what those different ways of being are is a great thing to do with children at that age. I put in um, the chat two books that uh, I introduced to my own children when they were that age. Um, so I think um, through storytelling and books, um, you're able to introduce uh, these concepts and topics. Um, and yeah, and I agree with the, with the gender pronouns too, but I think there's, there's way to show that there's diversity in families so that all students kind of can see themselves in those stories. This is my lovely wife, Kathy. She's the one who is teaching for 36 years and uh, she can she's been listening from downstairs so she <laughs> so she wants to she wants to hear what the conversation is going on here that we do this uh, every once in a while but you know at, at that at that young age i think kids are kids are more accepting of one another at that age and if we could just keep that going uh somehow somehow they learn because we teach them uh how to how to discriminate against other people and they learn they learn values from other people um, but my experience with little kids is little kids seem to they're more accepting than anyone they're even accepting of me so so, <laughs> so I, I think it's just to nurture that environment and keep kids just thinking about one another and being sensitive and and caring for not one another I always learn so much from you all. Um, thank you, Rob, for for giving me a chance to come on here. And and um, I think this is a great time to note that it's always also okay to say if you were wrong about something or if you said something wrong. Speaking of which, um, Ibn al Arabi is a famous Sufi poet, and Ibn Battuta, which whose name I also listed there, is the famous traveler. So uh, forgive my misspoken moment there, friends. So on behalf of all of us, I'll just thank you again for all that you've uh, presented. And um, our class is going to go on a little. Oh, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>